So um, this says that the, the conference says that it's a role playing and simulation conference, but it actually seems to be an edulard conference in disguise. So <laughs> can, can, can everybody raise your hand if you know what the term edulard means roughly? Okay. I, I, all right. And I, for the two people who did not raise their hands, EduLARP is, of course, live action role play in that tradition designed for educational goals and purposes. And I wanted to define that because then, uh, for me, it's a very awkward term. I am a LARP designer, and I also happen to be a German media professor, and I tend to now design LARPs based on German films. Uh, but bringing them into the classroom to me is a bit of a, a struggle. So, uh, I, I have. I'm talking again today about a proposition. It's not included in the title here, but it's, it, it, this is a proposition of how to teach German uh, literature through LARP, not a successful demonstration thereof. I don't have that yet, but um, I, I, I theorize that live action role playing could be used to engage students in motions as well as itself become a tool for literary interpretation. Now, a lot of adaptation. Um, theory or, or even um, adapt, LARP adaptations of literature tend to be about um, how can I explain this book better, which is a good purpose for that, especially in a literature um, uh, context. But I'm going to one-up it and say your interpretation of the, the literature itself can be built into the game and can be discussed as such, which actually brings the game studies aspect into the room. Um, I also argue that nano games are awesome. Just uh, nano games in American freeform are very much in dialogue. They function as a adaptable, um, minimal barrier to entry means into to the material. And I talk about two uh, examples that were not designed by me, but actually by my students, um, as as interpretations of two specific German texts: uh, Goethe's uh, Die Leiden des Jungen Werthes and um, uh, Mutterzunge by Amina Zedi. Evan, we just realized here not everybody knows what nano games are either. Of course. So a nano game is a game that takes about an hour or less, fifteen minutes to an hour, and uh, and, and usually nano games uh, have a small number of participants, but they can also uh, some of them, especially in a specific tradition that I'll explain in a moment. Um, can expand outwards in terms of the number of participants. So a nano game, uh, again, is, is, is a specific short, sharp shock, as Emily said, uh, where, where, where you, you stick the uh, participants with maybe one or two points through game mechanics. And they, they can even fit as, as small as a business card, which is where they, they, that they originated. Um, LARP overcomes the emotional barrier to entry on texts, right? And, and in, in this respect, um, uh, for me, it, it, I, there's an emotional barrier for me using LARPs in the classroom. I have a complex around it because I create LARPs in my day, but I'm like, my LARPs have uh, sexual content and some kind of awkward stuff that I'd have to explain to administrators, and I would need a very supportive uh, department. Fortunately, I now have that supportive department who is totally backing everything I'm doing, which is actually the reason why I'm able to, to enter into that. But and of course, uh, I don't think I don't see LARP design as a neutral thing. I don't see it as just a thing. Oh, here's how I explain this book to someone. I see it as this is a means of interpreting the text, and and someone else could design a different LARP on the same text, and it would be a very different outcome. Um, so. Um, I, I looked into the German uh, game research, actually, at educational games, and there is a long tradition of German educational games, but they're usually uh, trivia or uh, monopoly-based or, um, or Jeopardy, in the, in the, and, and of course they're usually saying, well, how can I run Jeopardy more often in my German classroom to make it more fun? That's great. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that we've been doing that. However, uh, LARP has not entered the German classroom, and Fundamentally, I teach a German literature overview in which the students lack knowledge in all these awesome things. They don't really know much about European history, even though we, we come from a Eurocentric point of view with a lot of history in, in Western classrooms. They also don't know it. Uh, it's a sort of bed rock that they, you know, you don't need to necessarily know the outcomes of the Treaty of Westphalia, but when did uh, Germany, when was Germany founded? 1871. 1871, Klaus Rosted, you get a flower. <laughs> okay. 
1871, right? But, but, but most of my students don't know this. Uh, they're, all, they're also struggling with vocabulary. I teach these courses in German. So um, I can't give them a 20-page world document. I can maybe give them this much text that they can reliably digest, and it has to be good. It has to also include simple words that they're mostly going to understand with a few bits of vocabulary. But so expanding out with scaffolding. Um, they have, probably haven't read the book. It goes without saying. Uh, they, they, and, and also the emotional engagement. Why should they read the book, right? Why should I care? Who, who you know, it, 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 and, and we can't always presume this intellectual uh, curiosity. And finally, that game design is itself a form of persuasion, and, it, and, and, and they don't quite understand that. You know, usually games are fun or interesting, and we need to move past that. Have they been assigned the book that they haven't read, or have they not been assigned the book they haven't read? Well, they've always been assigned it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, David. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I mean, from, from a realistic point of view, like, I'm sitting here, there's 20 people, let's not waste our time, shall we? So, um, it, it, it's, it's a, um, a, a, my hypothesis is, of course, uh, overcoming these emotional commitments will uh, increase engagement on other fronts, so that if I solve this problem, then maybe we can expand outwards to the other. Uh, this is a, a shot from my game Metropolis, based off of the German Expressionist film from the, from the Intergon run. And of course, um, uh, one of the reasons why I designed this game was to demonstrate um, how Expressionist theater worked. And so people play the parts of the city, as, and, and here's evil robot Maria trying to seduce the workers, um, as in, in um, Metropolis. So what I, what I argue, of course, is that games aren't neutral. I made Metropolis to make a specific argument. Most human's progress is the low, a run, low, a run game. And it's, uh, it's about this, um, uh, it, it's about sort of the arbitrariness of obstacles, right? If you've seen run, low, a run, she encounters all these obstacles. And in post-human's progress, they create obstacles. Voyage to Venus, Planet of Death is a sex farce in which then people wind up dead on Venus. Um, and and here's, our, here's our space crew. You may recognize some people in that blurry image that you know. Um, but, but of course, this was, was a way for me to um, explore sort of a communist spaceship as a locus for intimacy. And none of these games are suitable for the classroom, right? Because in some ways, Metropolis is too long. It, 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 it's physically ableist. Um, uh, City of Fire and Coin over here has like pulp fantasy sex involved with it. There's some things that, that would be potentially problematic. So I kind of then looked to the other side of, of the equation and said, okay, who has adapted literature well into LARP? Anna Westerling has been my main influence on this front, but also uh, Emily Kerr Bosch just did a, a, uh, an adaptation of Milton called uh, Darkness Visible. Anna's game is called Growing Up, and it's an adaptation of Sense and Sensibility. These are powerful games that also make specific arguments and, and also force me to reconfront the literature that um, I wanted to discuss. So I thought, hmm, how do, we, how do we get into something that I could play in a class, that I could lower the bar to entry for adaptation? And I thought, hmm, we've got now several examples. Uh, in 2014, uh, several of us, uh, Jason Morningstar, Emily Kerr Boss, myself, uh, Strix Beltran, um, Jay Lee, Kat Jones, we all decided, you know what, we need to create a, a, a contest in which we can um, uh, get more games that have, have flexible player counts, short amounts of time, and can still deliver. That, it, that content uh, from the Golden Cobra contest is all online. You can find our 2014 and 2015 contest winners, and there's it's over 100 games that you can run almost immediately with very little prep for a flexible player count. The Hashtag Feminism Connect collection is also games that, that um, I think are exemplary in making a specific short argument about one aspect of uh, feminism. And if you're looking for educational games, I always say educators look at games, look at good games, look at games that the, the ones that seem to work and then design outward from there rather than, than, than um, adding, uh, you, you know, and just adding dice to a, to a specific scenario. So at this point, then I'm going to turn to, to two of the examples that my stu of, of games that my students designed using the Golden Cobra contest and the feminism uh, collection as their examples. Right? They didn't know what LARP was, 
or anything. But, but so I started them here rather than with Vampire the Masquerade. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Unrequited is based on the sorrows of young murder. Um, and, and here is most of the text of the game. So, everyone stand up. Um, one person, your name is, actually, it's, it, it, everybody's going to get a little card, and, and it will say one of these, these three things. One is, your name is Albert. Go to someone who is standing by themselves. If they say a compliment, ask them to marry you. Okay? And, and this is assuming you haven't read the, read the, um, the novel, right? A second, uh, uh, other players, uh, your name is Lotta. Stay where you are. If someone comes up to you and give them a compliment, if they ask you to marry them, say yes. Stay next to that person. Okay, third. Your name is Vatra. Find a person who is engaged. Tell them you are madly in love with them, and if they don't love you back, you will have to eventually kill yourself. Stand next to them. <laughs> the end. The game is over when everyone is in a group of three. If you are left out, you will fight, either find someone or die alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this game classroom ready? I don't know. I think it's a simple, brutal algorithm with a sorting algorithm similar to uh, Pit, if any of you played the Pit game. I mean, more, more or less, every, you, you've got three groups, A, B, C, and you guys sort yourselves out into groups of A, B, C. Um, and, and in practice, this game actually involves a whole classroom full of people um, suddenly clustering into very awkward groups of three. And does anyone know the plot line of Sorrows of Young Verter at all? So, the, the, the plot line is, of course, about um, uh, Lotti, who's, who's quite desirable but already in a relationship with Albert, and Verter is a sensitive spirit, loves poetry, likes to sit at home, read, look at thunderstorms, and think poetic thoughts. And he then looks at Lotta and says, Why can't we be together? And Lotta's like, I really like you as a friend. <laughs> And Vertra eventually just can't really deal with that and shoots himself in the head. Now this, of course, this novel became wildly popular mostly because Vertra embodied this kind of interiority that in the late 18th century um, many people identified with but couldn't quite um, articulate themselves. And Vertra wore these yellow vests in the story and so yellow vests became a popular thing around Europe. Those are things I can teach afterwards, but the basic premise is, is actually all incorporated as physically, through physically co-present, not even simulation, but just ordering yourselves into these awkward, terrible groups, um, uh, has already summarized and, and the game and made a specific argument about it. And I would say it's a very cynical uh, physical summary of the story's content. Um, so, I, and, and then from there, maybe you want to read, about the, read the story and see the complexity. The second example I've got from the students is Babel On, uh, by, by, uh, based on Östermar's Mutterzunge. In the game, students are to divide themselves into groups of three to five with at least four groups represented. Each group then rapidly invents a family life in accordance with a series of questions. In German, of course, what was home life life? Who are you in relation to each other? And so, so that will actually deal with sort of intro uh, elementary or, or intermediate level German questions where they'll, where they'll have the vocabulary. After five minutes of spontaneous family creation, families are divided up so that members are meeting each other. Once the game begins, each player will be able to use a noun only once, so words like brother and sibling are quickly exhausted. Players write down all the nouns they use up and continue to meet other families. Then the scene cuts to Camp Petois, where people from all the different families intermingle and decide with whom they feel the most affinity by the end of ten minutes, losing their language all the while. All the, while. the game is followed by a debrief. Again. How many of you have read Mutterzunge? <laughs> but how many of you, when you were playing this game, would know what it was about? What's it about? Loss of language? Yes, losing language. And oh my gosh, this is actually a pretty decent interpretation of the book. Uh, and Mutterzunge is about a Turkish-German woman who has, who has moved, uh, or, 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 or who has who is sort of moved into the uh, German literary circles, and, and then having to figure out her Turkish and Germanness. Okay. Anders and, and, and Klaus are giving me love. This is great. So um, Ashton uh, wrote this game and, 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 again for for this kind of to, to, to see how you lose language in addition to acquiring language. And I think this is incredibly powerful for a, a language classroom. So um, in in end effect. Um, you, 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 you have to generate your own community language to survive. And I think it also builds empathy, right, for, for various groups. And I'm going to quote uh, 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 Maury Brown and Ben Morrow for, for uh, the, the building of games for empathy, for various uh, 
various marginalized groups and also to see how literature is dealing with, with this, this kind of alienating experience. So to, to conclude, um, the, these are games that I have not formally run in the classroom, but in the fall I'm, I'm teaching 14 texts and I'm running 14 nano games, period. Uh, all the, the, the texts will be introduced with nano games. It's someone else's uh, uh, um, responsibility to fill in the historical context, etc. But in, in end effect, they will see not only how, how their emotions are activated, but then do they agree with or disagree with how this game for, framed the experience. And we can actually go there if you have a short, sharp game that activates everyone's emotions. Thank you very much.